opportunity. Yes. I, I just want to mention one thing. I did told some of the people here already, but we, we just got a very special, um, I'm not sure what they call it, a special coup, let's call it. We applied to the Franciscans for this group. I've never done this before, but I figured we'd try for this group to have a solemn entry into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Oh I'm a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre. I don't know if that helped or not. I don't know. But anyway, what we did is we applied that when we first arrived the day after tomorrow in Jerusalem, that they, the Franciscans would escort us with pomp and circumstance. We'll all have donkeys to ride. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I still, I still, I still, I still, so in other words, you can all ride on my back. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, the Franciscans are going to escort us into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and even if there's a thousand other pilgrims, they will all be moved aside, and they will play, they will give us a solemn entry, and they will welcome all of this group into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and then each of you will be able to go into the tomb four at a time and touch the place where Jesus was buried. No, he's been here before. This hasn't happened before. We pulled it off for this. How many hundred? I know people. <laughs> is the secretary, personal secretary to the patriarch. Oh, so anyway, when we get to Jerusalem, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go into the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, and you'll be able to go into the tomb and see this. And then we'll be coming back after this a day later or so for mass, a high mass in front of the Holy Sepulchre, where Father Simon will actually be praying the Eucharistic prayers inside the tomb. You won't even be able to hear him. You only hear him when he comes out and says, peace be with you. But, um, so you, we've got, you think today, yesterday, and today we're good? Just for anyway, We're very fortunate. I have to go make the video so the family there, but I'm going to listen to the, the recorded copy of this talk. Okay, Steve. Now, is anybody too cold in here? <laughs> you can't kind of blame the hot air on me, Steve. <laughs> I got those it was here high. before you came. That's right. oh, wow. there are, are there any windows high, that could be opened or any? Uh... Well, at, the, the two big air conditioners are both on high, and they just turn them on. I think they're actually cooking those hot dogs in the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We're in the upper room. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the, and the fire is coming down. <laughs> Remember Uticus? Falling asleep. Eutychus, it says in Acts chapter 20, Paul was preaching until after midnight and the candles were lit and the room got hot and Eutychus was sitting in the windowsill and he fell asleep and fell out. And Scott, if, if Dr. Hahn here speaks till after midnight, you have permission to fall asleep. Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. I make no sense. <laughs> Fellow pilgrims, we don't have a PA system here, and so uh, you can per you, you can put on the little ear knot. Can everybody hear me in the back? Fair enough. Yeah, I've never had trouble projecting her. So my mom told me ever since I was a young boy. Let's open our time together in a word of prayer in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of History, and as we travel around as your sons and daughters on this pilgrimage, we pray that you would open our eyes to the mysteries that pervade this whole land, this holy land that really became a sort of divine laboratory so that you could do work in the world to show how it is that your mercy and love patiently await our response and your Holy Spirit powerfully enables us to respond with the gift of faith. And so we ask in the name of Jesus for the gift of the Holy Spirit to increase our faith so that we might hear in the words of the human writers of Scripture the voice of God. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the first in a series of talks that I'll be giving, along with Kimberly and Mike Aquilina. And I'm deliberately building on the experience that we've shared today as pilgrims. Not only in terms of the places that we've seen, but also in terms of the times that we have studied. The Old Testament and the New, and how it was that the New was concealed in the Old, and the Old was revealed and fulfilled by Jesus in the New. But the New Testament is still new, even after 21 centuries, because there's something quite eternal about it. And so I want to reflect with you about time and space, and how God makes himself present to us in time and space. He accommodates himself to our own circumstances in order to elevate us and empower us to share in his own life, even though that life exceeds our own capacities to understand it. God is eternal. God is omnipresent. So he's not subject to the limitations of space and time, but he's also capable of overcoming those limitations. And that's how we celebrate Christ coming in the fullness of time. We heard temporal references today, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration. What do we hear Jesus say in Matthew chapter 16 to close out the chapter? Matthew 16, verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And many people assume that time reference specifically refers to one event, namely the second coming. And as a result, a lot of scholars ended up sort of abandoning their faith in Christ and Scripture and the church because here's clear evidence that Jesus not only expected it, but taught it and raised everybody's expectations only to have them dashed within a generation or two. I don't believe that's true. And I believe, as I mentioned to a few of you, that Pope Benedict in his wonderful book that I think is going to be destined, it's destined to become his legacy in a certain sense, that book, Jesus of Nazareth. The first volume is out, but a second volume has practically been promised. And in that first volume, he specifically states that the proper way to understand Matthew 16, 28 is by reading it in context, and especially simply by sitting up and paying attention to what follows immediately in the transfiguration narrative in the very next few verses. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. And what do they do? They go up and they witness this spectacular transformation. And what do they see? The Son of Man in his glory, the glory of his kingdom. So there were at least three who didn't taste death before they saw this. Even though it is not referring exclusively to the end time, it certainly shows how Christ gives us sort of a down payment on that. And that's exactly what the church teaches, not only about Jesus' statement in 1628, but also the significance of this transfiguration. That it's more than just a physical sign. It's more than just, you know, one of those miracles that so many people who follow Jesus got obsessed with.